Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. What an audience. Uh, you, you heard Philip introducing my friend Tony. It's, it's incredible how someone could be CEO at 34 years old, work towards merging one of the biggest banks, not in, only in Nigeria, but in Africa, walking away at 47, beginning a new phase of his life, becoming an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, all around good guy. And his passion remains in Africa. That's what we're going to be talking about in a couple minutes, folks. Building businesses across Africa. Please welcome Mr. Tony Illumino. And let me give you an example of something that's happened recently. 
I was reading on the website of Ghana Investment Promotion Council about investments in Ghana, FDI investments in Ghana. And since 1999 to date, Ghana has had about $6.1 million FDI investment by Nigerian investors in Ghana. And between 2005 and now, you have about 17 companies that invested in Ghana, about $1.5 million from Nigeria. Prior to this time, Ghanaians were quite and one of the reasons for this and Ghana is changing is in 2005 or 4, 2005, up to 2005, there was no Nigerian bank in Ghana. We, 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 we approached the government of Ghana at one level and finally got a license for UBA in Ghana. And both that, it has encouraged a lot of other Nigerian investors to go to Ghana to do this. Now, what is the learning point here? Yes. The learning point for African leaders is we need to free up economies, we need to remove this mindset of and this kind of level of distrust amongst us, and we need to begin to engage in terms of uh, regional cooperation and business expansion and also across Africa because we need that economy correctly. So we need to begin to do that things differently. And uh, there are a lot of benefits in the corridor intra African investment across Africa. By the way, that's why I can Nigeria for Ghana, it's a 45 minute flight. Short flight. Right. Unbelievable, but thank you, Mrs. Change. Okay, let's look across the world, Tony, and the fact that it's looking pretty wobbly outside of Africa. Europe is shaky. America, well, you know their problems. Is this the window? Is this the right time to invest in Africa, amongst Africa? Is this the moment? This what's happening in the world today, and especially as it relates to Africa, this is my view for a unique opportunity. Everyone has said Africa is the last one to Africa, last one to but this is not going to happen if Africans first do not realize that truly we will have a They will go a strong platform that can actually change the entire economy for Africa and for some part of the world. And two is the African business leaders should begin to have confidence in investing in Africa. It's happening now, but the lot more can happen. If we go with the technology that no one was going to develop Africa, if we invest in Africa, we try not to invest in Africa. So I think it's a moment for us, it's a wonderful opportunity for Africa. And we have seen also a community and myself going to the office and ask for support to solve the economic problems. So it's actually a signal in terms of the government. Yeah. Who would have thought that Angola would be bailing out its former colonial master, Portugal? <coughs> Who would have thought? It's uh, indeed uh, a turning point for Africa, but I believe that we also have a lot to do, and both the government and the private sector level. At government level, our government should begin to develop a stronger economic environment that makes itself to Factors. There are certain factors that are lacking in Africa and some of our economies are going to be to address. And until we address this, we might not be able to take advantage of the opportunity. So there are certain main factors that we need to do this. And both the hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure will not be long. We need to make sure things work and that when they start, they're comfortable with the contract and they can force contract is in order to be necessary. So I believe generally that the opportunity cost. For, for, for the also the private sector in Africa, we need to take advantage of the opportunities that we see. But I think that the new Africa, the rising African private sector leaders are going to take advantage of this. So if you take, for example, the case of UBA, you mentioned during the introduction, UBA grew from a one country financial institution to a pan African institution operating in 17 African countries, if you have an entire destiny. Uh, it is the realization for the fact that Africa is about to take off, and for Africa to take off, financial transitions are important, payment system is very important, and having an African plan that's wide across Africa that can pay and support the free movement of goods, uh, payment segment of the trade obligations, and payment is of the transfers amongst the cities of Africa, who actually have the ability to be the end of the day. Folks with the mics, young ladies with the microphones, please walk around the floor just in case anyone has a question. But on that point, Tony, you just mentioned private entrepreneurs, private, uh, private uh, business. 
the Tony Unumendo Foundation. Right? It's about what, 12 plus months, year, about old, 20 months old. What did you change? How is that going to help? How is that going to help turn things around? I'd like to, uh, it would be nice to add some uh, visual uh, color to this so we can understand what we're supposed to If you look at uh, Africa, and this happens across almost every African country, I take Kenya on the telephone, let's take Kenya for instance. And you have a, a son, a son wants it off in Nigeria, in a then aspiring business entrepreneur. He puts himself in school, he lives in a certain part of Lagos, he goes to work in another part of Lagos, he has to wake up about 4 a.m. in the morning to go to work. We don't have a good transportation infrastructure. So he spends about four hours on the road to get to work at 8 o'clock. Sam gets to work at 8 o'clock and there's no electricity. So he does not have access to the internet. Is that Lagos or Nairobi? Lagos. He does not have access to the internet. And then he has certain clients, partners he has to deal with. And by the way, you know, talking about Lagos, internet and code, you know, it's not just Lagos and it's in most African countries. You have the sounds in most African countries goes with this. And it sounds like uh, like something dramatic or straight. And I'm put, you know, yourself in the position of SAC in this tough environment, who suggests to school, he has about 10 people and then on him, he goes to waste of 40 then to go to work, he needs to work. At least he spent four hours in traffic, gets to work on the electricity, etc. And he's competing with someone in the same company. They are aspiring to become entrepreneurs. And clearly, it will be an open task for Sam to succeed the way another Sam in Silicon Valley will succeed. And the Sam Silicon Valley has angel capitalists, venture capitalists. Banks, etc., ready to support this initiative and idea. And this guy, he was suffering to get to work and all that things, also has to talk about how to fund the business. So, what we think is that Sam doesn't need a better person or institution to support him, that institution and people who have been through this kind of background, who are no more uh, better people than Sam. And we think that if Sam was supported, because this is a condition that most African business entrepreneurs go through and succeed in life 10 years or 15 years, 20 years down the line. Sam will also help to offer other Sam so that similar circumstances. And Sam will become an example to people that if someone they will succeed, they too can succeed that. The foundation therefore seeks in a nutshell to support business and having business small and medium-scale business uh, entrepreneurs, business leaders who have social right to the next level by mentoring, by training, by leadership development, by providing some and what we call innovative financing support system that seeks to buy or support into the vision that some of the entrepreneurs have for them necessarily taking all their businesses. Support them and encourage them to succeed. Expose them to convenience in this kind of session, train them, provide networking facilities for them, and show the amount to our all that we succeed in succeed in the development of the country. And we're talking across Africa, not just Nigeria, all the way to across the country. Yeah. Would that help Sam, for example, Sam, from, from going to Europe, from going away, from the brain drain has driven a lot of our young, smart, brilliant Africans to work outside of Africa. Because that's where they feel appreciated. That's where they make money. You know, there are two sides to this issue of brain drain. First, of course, to help Sam to stay back, uh, because uh, Sam has uh, role models around that he can learn from, who are also ready to support him. So, see, and of course, Sam himself has to be the group, of course, aspiring to become an entrepreneur, he has some things. Then into something like 
But I think the ECL people who wanted to go offshore to land to set the work, I think it's good, it's not bad. Um, and what is important and the challenge for our campaign as leaders and our leadership is to create the right environment that when should they decide to come back home, they have warm in the world to walk, they have some good environment, public environment to walk in, that will not make more different from what they were used to. Or two, they want to go into business and uh, entrepreneurship, which I think we need a lot of in Africa, that there are enabling environment for this to join. The enabling environment of the competitiveness factors, the ease of doing business in Africa, and the, through this business decision processes, the red trade that we have in certain areas, creating certain infrastructure, there's no reason to not have internet access in office, to have access to what we want to do. Communication and our own security and the law. So I believe that we should encourage people, young and entrepreneurs, to remain in Africa. For those who go offshore, uh, there's nothing wrong with us. However, if they decide to come back, we should create a pool that we can come back. So there's nothing wrong with straddling both continents, right? You know, you can have one foot over here and one over there. I think that we live today in the global world, so we have people, families living in the center part of the globe and working some you know, family members working on that. I don't think there's any kind of in fact we need to travel the rest of the world to do our children. But above all we should create to make Africa become more sensation where Europeans, Asians can go to our children so that they work and they can get the opportunities, tourism, etc. We need to be challenged for African business men and our public sector leadership to begin also to turn Africa into that center where others want to work from our city. Is this happening in Africa now? Yes, I think it's going to happen. You have uh, some, some Chinese coming from Africa. Lots of Chinese. A lot, a lot of Chinese from China. I'm not against it. I'm not against it. I'm not against that because there are certain conversations I'm not against that. But the gaming process, I mean, I mean, yeah. Oh yes, I think that uh, people are also coming to Africa, but a lot more will come if we if we if we look at the case of the five a few years ago, so that you know, we know I'm going to find the financial crisis. We can indeed turn some cities in Africa to this. But it doesn't just happen by the way, but it happens by the way. This is what we want to achieve, our plan, our work towards you is a detailed thing with this Yeah, yeah. Question time folks, anybody question? I'm sure you have any. There's a microphone right there, you want to have a question right now. It's a good time. Okay, there's a gentleman right here. I can front this. So give us your name, tell us where you're from. Give us questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alfred Munoyana. I'm from the Zimbabwe. Um, I just want to seek your comment. Uh, we have had uh, a media onslaught in Zimbabwe. And obviously businesses have suffered. But Africa is quiet. Where are our media practitioners? Thank you. Also, has the media been quite negative? No, I think. Why? I think, oh, <laughs> <you're not> <laughs> I think uh, yeah. the point you is important. I was discussing with uh, the C recently, just last week, and I said to the CEO, there are key jobs the CEO must address himself. I said, one, when I say himself, not necessarily you do it to show interest in those areas. And one is communication, brand position. And so what you said, talking about the country is about the chat, right? Not just about the it's at the national level I'm talking about Zimbabwe, but can relate that to a private corporate level also. The point of image perception is important. And then it's trying to say what has created your image, you know, you have to have certain products. And those photos shape and um, have a, a project company specific for a country. But I like to leave the issues that have created that kind of image. But I want to call from African journalists, communication executives, that the era of colonialism is over, the era of fighting for national independence is over. So we need to keep to reorientate our mindset right now towards the kinds of communication the great pressure or shining in Africa. Every time 
we talk about only the negative things about Africa. There are also a lot of positive things coming out of Africa. So why we must uphold the ethics of truth and honesty in journalism, we must also balance it, but truth also is that you balance everything. We balance to say the good things and the bad things. There are good things happening in Zimbabwe currently, Zimbabwe economy is actually turned around, and certain minerals are being properly exploited now, but they also have certain challenges in Zimbabwe. So the point is, let's balance good and the bad. Say the good things that you have made, also say the bad things that you have made. And Zimbabwe will not try to do. I think so. But that was a great basket of Africa, but it's not that cool. I think Zimbabwe, in my view, for all of this, I'm going to watch. Um, and uh, I think it's a matter of time. I, mean, I know one of the leaders I have been interested in has applied to Zimbabwe was a new life in the name of the because it's a tolerant. You know, I think the recent economies publication to cover me is Africa right Okay. About 10 people. Less than two decades ago, the same magazine wrote that this caption that was also complimentary. The rate is changing. So the fact that Zimbabwe was in a certain situation or has been in a situation in the past does not mean it will remain that way. So we need to also look at Zimbabwe beyond the current or past challenges and see the future that, uh, that the country presents to investors. Great. Thank you. Question back there. Question back there. Salim, Salim, the chairman of the 24 Media. Uh, morning, Tony. Morning, Jeff. Um, corruption has always been one of the major hindrances of, of international investors coming into the continent and Africans working around the continent. Uh, Tony, how have you dealt with the issue of corruption that, that seems to go from the leaders down in most countries in Africa to build the kind of business that you've built? I think there are two points on this uh, issue of corruption. First is uh, why one is not supporting corruption. I think corruption has been overplaced or emphasized as the reason for the financial development of our economies. It is bad and we all must work to address it. We have seen countries like Brazil, even India in the past. They were seem to be more corrupt. But today they turn the corner and they do better. So we need to put our leaders, put private political leadership accountable to make sure we have a better system that is free of corruption. But we must not begin to stay as most people do right out of the fact that because of corruption we're not succeeding. In fact, if certain aspects of our economic life change, then corruption might even it could even help to fight corruption. But now the promise of that the point you raise about corruption, that also presents in fact a uh, shift between reality and perception. You would think that in good where some of the businesses we 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 can call or say you be able now see or give it that corruption will be a factor in getting licenses to update. Yeah. But that's not the case. Oh, yeah. If I would look at the case of this happening, yeah. I think UBA must have been the first bank to get licensed, banking license and then after about 17 years. If I see the bank was closed, did we pay anything to any political lawyers of facilitation? No, we didn't. So the point is the African economy and after the that she the last thing is changing, but it doesn't seem to me that the world is actually following or realizing that there's a shift to what the world needs to be in Africa. I think that corruption is a factor, but it's not an environmental factor. I think there are huge opportunities. In you do have companies in Africa that set the terms how they want to engage, and they do actually engage on those standards in business in Africa. So we need to be on my name is Paul. I'm a question from Nigeria. I'm a business for about 20 years. Um, I just want to find out what we intend to do about the spirit of entrepreneurship in Africa. Um, you want to run a business 
I want to take it to the next level. But we discover that most times, let me talk about Nigeria now. They are always looking for big names to deal with. Most times, your proposal doesn't even get to the table for concentration. You are not even invited for a meeting. They don't even know the stuff you are made of. I qualify as an icon prize I don't know what happens in Nigeria. Uh, and it's easier for you to do business in a place like yours. You throw in your proposal, you are invited, you do your presentation, they get to meet you and they give you jobs. I just want to know, is there anything that Tony can do to help me? <laughs> 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 shall I reflect? Oh. Well, I like it. Well, I like it. Let, let me let me even rephrase the question. What can Tony do? The likes of Tony do to help the sound so I talked about. You know, the point. That microphone. Thanks. Okay. 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 The point is, uh, I give my. Let me give you illustrate the point I want to make with myself. When in 1997, about 15 years ago, 1997, a group of uh, bank uh, executives and I came together. We had a dream. We felt, uh, based on our reading and understanding of the financial landscape, that the banks were too many banks in operation, and the way they conducted, you know, in our reading, we made it more sustainable that we keep, we have over 100 banks in Nigeria. And so we decided to set up a company to acquire distressed financial institutions and turn them around, etc. At that time, we were called Cowboys in Nigeria, if you, if you remember the case of Nigeria. Why did they call us Cowboys? And I just said, we were extremely young, very young then. Banking practice belonged to those around 60 years plus, etc. So we had the glass barrier that you have in today, what you said. But we dealt with it in a certain way. One is, uh, you know, every human being, and it's interesting to share this because we also have as final entrepreneurs, we need to define what we want to achieve. And two, we need to ask ourselves what are the success factors? You know, so is it contact, is it capital resource, is it human resource, what kind, what do we need? And what time frame do we need to make it work? So that, you know, the time frame setting, setting your expectations in the wrong way because you might set expectations initially that are not realistic. So what we did was, okay, nobody understands us. The kind of banking we would do would be different initially from what we would like to do in the middle to long term. And to us, since we are acquiring distressed financial institutions, that was not the time for us to discriminate. Let's open the banking up to anyone who wanted to come to bank with us. And so we opened the banking up, and people who had just hundred dollars, fifty dollars, had access to us. We realized that after that, we went to get some money. If we went to share petroleum, if we went to Guinness, Diageo, they would almost certainly not bank with us because we did not have what they would require by what the internal system, rating system, to meet their banking decision. So in military, it's called the concept of repeat colonization. We approach it from a tangential point instead of frontal attack. And we said, let's move in a manner that was little but consistent. And so over time, what happened? Those individuals who were bank became decision makers in big organizations. And because they had a history, of what our bank represented, we were able to connect. And they became the one those inviting us to set it bigger challenges. So in a nutshell, my address for you, my mothers were here. I tried to set standard expectations initially that we yeah. provide. Let's face my suggestion. Say, in five years time or ten years, and this is what we want to do. But year one, we start like so the places you apply to for setting job consideration will not be your ultimate property of vendors. We will take it one step at a time. So, uh, but the truth is, I would like to say more to you. So I would like you to, I would like to have your card. 
And this is what we have in this uh, entrepreneurship uh, training mentoring uh, mentoring program. I'd like to invite you to have sessions like this also. There are questions to share and we'll see how we can directly be more supportive to you. Because what you need and what most aspiring entrepreneurs need at times is not just cash, not just one, or single card, but listening also and hearing from those who have been through that process. And as I said, for some who have suffered or going through those challenges, no better role model or mentor than those who are going through that process are going to where they are. It's also in the time system, so I will not give up. Because if Tony made it, we too can make it. So you've all just been invited to Nigeria, folks. <laughs> no, that looks like that would be my day. Tony, here's my card right now, okay? <laughs> Anyone from this side before we come back in? To the front, yes, okay. Hi. Yeah, good. Uh, my name is Brian Patel from South Africa. Uh, firstly, I compliment you on establishing the foundation that you have. One of the key problems Africans face is African leadership. I just wish that African entrepreneurs would change places with African political leaders, that Africa would be a very different place. The biggest challenge we face, the biggest challenge we face as Africans is problems not from without, but from the people. Would your foundation consider establishing an African leadership academy to infuse African political leaders with some of the key markets that de defines and determines African entrepreneurs? Is that good? Just last week, the World Bank and the Tony Elumelu Foundation convened a meeting of leading Africa based, Africa funded, Africa funded foundations in Lagos. It's now called the Eco Initiative. Now, why was this convened? The World Bank came from Washington and the top African, African foundations were represented. Why was this conveyed? It's just to advance what you said. We realize that Ecobank and King, the key thing to do to encourage economic development, economic growth and prosperity in Africa, must start with the basic things. We must have a leadership that's aligned totally to this objective. We must also have a leadership beyond being aligned to it or with it. It's also committed to creating the competitiveness factors and the environment that will help businesses to work. So that if you aspire to become something, the environment should not kill it. The environment should, in fact, encourage and support it. And so we thought that it would be nice to commence the process of having philanthropy changing in the world today from just uh, donations to being catalytic to be truly transformational. So that instead of just giving scholarship to one person, you create the environment that will enable one million people to have access to education at the reduced cost. So this whole process has started and we received the book from South Africa, East Africa, and some funding from North Africa and Gold, is to enable us, hopefully next year, begin to engage with African leaders. So we have African leadership session like the AU, meeting in Addis Ababa, we should be able to sit with them and say, let's bring private sector perspective to your discussion. And by the way, as I've said at this city recent forum, I think that it could be time for African leaders, political leaders, to begin to rethink the essence of African Union. African Union was founded at a time that Africa was preoccupied with colonial fights. We wanted emancipation of African countries, we wanted independence, and so we find it African Union to personally try this. The world has moved on. We are all emancipated politically, at least in terms of from our colonial values. Let's now begin to rethink and reshape the African Union to become more economically focused. Let's begin to look at economic issues. Let's begin to look at things that will create true prosperity in Africa social world. Africa has been to every so that's I agree with you. And, you know, organizations like Legato would jump in and help, but we can take advantage of organizations like this because this is the moment. I think uh, what Legato is doing is, is 
wonderful. I said before, uh, even from having this kind of session for small and medium and upcoming entrepreneurs is wonderful. The African foundations and the African private sector seek to engage with the rest of the world and seek to engage in a manner that is truly collaborative and will have maximum impact. I believe that working from Amsterdam and working from Mesa will be able to deliver the desired objective. No one understands how issue feels than the person who wears shoes. And so since you have African Foundation and well and that also foreign foundation, a collaboration to engage with government will help a lot. And by the way, I'd like to say that the Tony Develu Foundation is also um, working with some 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 foundations to capacitize and support our national government so that they begin to look more for economic issues. I'd like to see support to come in here to begin for this kind of opportunity that they're creating and again as I said before for the interest they have a commitment to Africa and Let me make up a right point real quick. Uh, he's talking about role models, basically, right? And, and there's a, probably a handful across the country. Your country, so I'm opposed to Toki so far, that, you know, a few people in Nigeria, Nico Dangote, Tony Olumelo, maybe a couple more in Kenya. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are there others out there, Tony? Are there? role models we can look up to, the aluminums of this continent that we can look up to and say, I don't want to be there. They made their money legitimately. Yes, I see, yes. I think uh, we do have uh, a handful of uh, successful African entrepreneurs and more coming. And as I said before, we and successful African business leaders must begin to engage in a way that one would encourage our government to put in place the right environment that would create more sales, more tonnage, more alicos, more uh, etc. of successful people. The whole idea is not to get there and walk it up and not allow others to come in. The whole idea, I believe, is that we need to have a lot more successful business people. But the starting point is private sector people who are successful supporting those who are coming up, the sons, the ballers that go, who have genuine business issues that can be dealt with by good advising, mentoring, calling people to city offices, watching how you do certain the how you take certain decisions, creating internship programs, fellowship programs, capacity building initiatives, etc. But supporting government is very, very important. So for me as I had great contact and go that we do need role models, we should create more role models. It's the concept of creating creative fishermen. We should create more role models. But to create this, government must play its own role, private sector must play its own role. The subject private sector must engage the government in level that will make government understand that what they seek to achieve and what private sector seek to achieve is the same. Just the root to it and the commitment to it and serious and that's the Yeah, kind of work out We'll take a couple of them and then we'll ask them together. Hey, go ahead, say you first. My name is Desmond Nadia. Uh, I used to work for the African Union. I'm now the founder and CEO of uh, FISA, that is Foundation for Indigenous Students of Africa. We set up here in Kenya. It's been operating now since May this year. And uh, we have already awarded some scholarships. But I'm taking on Tony for what he said about the AU. Having worked as the spokesperson of the AU and the former spokesperson of the OA, I think the bet is on two sides. Our leaders have done their best to set up the AU, the African Union. This was a change from the former OA, the Organization of African Unity. The AU is a total deviation from the other, it's a totally different organization. Why? Issues of the economy issues of health, issues of education became extraordinarily important for Africa and emphasis on these areas. What has the AU done different from the OEU that the African independence should see with their losses? We have the civil society organizations 
set up in the aid which wasn't in the OE. This allows the civil society, people in business, people in entrepreneurs, anybody to attend the pre summit conference where you make your case very well. This is taken through the PRC, that's the permanent representative committee, to the ministers, that's the conference of African ministers, and then to the summit decisions and then at two levels, at ministerial level and at the level of heads of state. The entrepreneurs have not seized the opportunity to do anything that is of benefit to Africa. I'm saying this because you have said that perception means everything. The way Africa is perceived by the international media is not the very best because stories are not balanced. This is a fact, we all know it. How do we do this? Have you done anything as African interpreters to set up an African television station that is pan African in nature that can counter some of the negative reports about Africa? That has not been done. Yes, I don't know. We get your point, my brother. We get your point. We don't have too much time. There's a couple more questions. How do we encourage? Right? Yes. How do we take it well, The way we have to encourage it is we have, have started setting up a foundation called Foundation for Indian Students of Africa, which gives scholarship at the top level, giving education at the highest level, master's, PhD, to get special correspondence in various fields. So that if we have experts in different fields, when everything is said, somebody will be able to say this is the right thing, that is not the right thing. And African entrepreneurs are challenged to take it up, attend the AU meetings, come out with something and do it. And let us have an African agency, a CNN, and one of those things that can stand in for Africa when things are not going too well. Because everybody has an agenda. Okay, so I guess you're going to talk to Salim Amin after this. Uh, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, let's have another question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, sir. Your question from Uganda. Uh, Tony, I have two questions for you. Uh, my first one is on intramediate trade. As an entrepreneur, I've really been baffled because it's not a magic bullet. I can't understand why, after 50 years of average of independence, we can't have a fast rate road connecting Dakar to Dar es Salaam. And if I have to trade with Tunisia, I have to go to Europe or I have to go to Doha or Dubai. So to me, uh, it just baffles me. It couldn't be financing. Why has it been so difficult to fix the road infrastructure? Because that is really the primary driver of intra-regional trade. And I'm sure my city get to Nigeria if that road was fixed in less than six months. Question two, Tony, you, are, you realize that most of our industries uh, use um, agricultural products as their source of raw material. But uh, climate change is real, climate change is here. And, uh, it is impacting on agribusiness very seriously. My concern is that the financial institutions are not helping agribusiness to mitigate the impact. Very specific to Uganda, I know UBA is there, but I'm not aware whether it even provides crop insurance. But there is one bank that provides crop insurance at 5%. Because of the inflation in our country of East Africa, that has been driven by food shortage. Banks are lending money at 27% and more, and at 5%. Do you really think the farmer or any agribusiness in his or her own mind can, can borrow and uh, uh, acquire crop insurance at 35% interest? So the question is what are the roles of financial institutions? They should stifle us, but they should work with us to address those common challenges. Thank you. Time for one more, and then we can combine. Is that okay? One more question, okay? You pick it, you pick it. My name is Joseph Potejaga from Nigeria. Uh, my question is to Tony. Uh, as the former CEO of one of the largest banks in Nigeria, uh, UBA, uh, at home we see the kind of support that uh, the commercial institution gives to young entrepreneurs. As you know very well, uh, entrepreneurs are basically people that have great ideas and they want to make an impact in the world. And so, in the process of 
starting their business, they definitely will need support. The amount of support they need is capital. Uh, but for entrepreneurs are also futuristic people, they want to think long term, and so the kind of support they also need should be long term. But what we see is the, the bank, for instance, will, will be more interested in financing trade and short term transactions. So, how are we going to encourage startup entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs or emerging entrepreneurs? Uh, this is of great concern to us. Is there a way that uh, the, the, uh, people like Tony can, can help uh, put some structures in place to encourage us? Uh, secondly, we have in the US, for instance, we have the SBA that kind of guides young entrepreneurs through this. You know, challenging and difficult terrain. Are we thinking of a similar thing for Africa? I like to start with uh, Dr. Ojako of the EU. I totally agree, agree with you, your call for setting uh, intervention by the private sector especially especially in the area of uh, communication so that uh, information is uh, accurately presented so that Africa can have some righteous event. So I'd like to call on Jeff and the Salims and Co to to think along this line and call on the private sector to support the initiatives I think they are trying. But speaking sir on the civil window that was created in AU on the uh, when you were there. You know, it's a matter of intent and reality. What we put on paper in chapters or could be different from what is actually happening. I have never gotten any invitation to any EU forum and I've never even heard about any of our communication. And that is one of the reasons we say we need to engage with the EU. So maybe when that engagement are beginning to know what the EU has, uh, has put in place that should engage every this kind of data that we need in Africa. Two is um, for intra regional trade. I think your spot on my friend from Uganda, infrastructure remains a problem. You know, somebody asked me the point about why regional unions are not working. And I said, first we need to understand why they were set up. One, you have the movement of goods and services across countries. Two, movement of money, and three, movement of people. Now, I do not think that we have done anything, we've done much to address the what will help us move goods and services easily from one country to the other, and that supports the point you raise. And this is where an organization like AU, if today's AU was beginning to address true economic issues, should begin to see how countries can be encouraged and how incentives can be put in place. You know, we say China is coming to Africa to to, to take advantage of opportunities here, land, commodities, um, natural resources. But we don't have a concerted platform for engaging with China as a continent. China go to Zambia, they engage one of Zambia, they go to DRC, they engage one of DRC. If we as a continent engage with China and say these are continental priorities, one, this kind of culture, two, this, China will do it. So the challenge for us, I go back sir, to the uh, EU should begin. Anyway, the private sector will engage the EU to make some of these things to happen also. The issue of climate change, agri support, etc. And the last point that was made here also about finance. I think I'll take both together. We need to understand also the structure of financial services uh, balance sheet, the balance sheet of, of the financial services sector. And also the so and also the nature of financial services industry. At times we think everything of financial is commercial bank, commercial bank, you know. There are some projects we need venture capitalists to come in to handle. 
and some projects in India capital is some uh, initiatives that uh, you also need the likes of uh, anyway, the the social uh, or impact investors. So there are but what we see is everyone thinks that commercial banks hold the key to every financial problem. Not quite, but it's also a sign of the state of development or the development of our financial system in Africa, which I think is beginning to, to change. So today, beyond commercial banks, you have some venture capital firms that are coming up, not in the scale and the, and the association of what you have in the US, or the journey has started. You also have like the the Tony Bell Foundation impact investment where impact investing where like in Tanzania we invested in a Matanga farm in Tanzania and not necessarily because of the profit uh, uh, return at the end of the day but as a way of catalyzing farming in that part of uh, of Africa and there are a lot of others I believe they got to and and the likes just before we came in to the mandate to an investment executive of the government, I would like the chief event officer of the Tony and Bill Foundation Council to be in touch with him to see how we can, on a collaborative basis, begin to also partner to deal with some of the opportunities that we see in Africa and based on our understanding of the risks and realities on ground, how we can support people like you, people like Sam, people like Paula, people like my friend from, from, from Uganda. Thank you very much. Well done.